Warning, acetic acid and acetic anhydride are irritating. Ketene is toxic. The experiment involves high temperatures. Perform the experiment outside or in a very well ventilated area. Hi guys, here is MIH. Since when I've started doing organic chemistry, the two main types of chemicals I have to get my hands on are solvents and dehydrating agents. Needless to say, having an array of solvents is essential as most organic reactions and purification procedures rely on the distinctive properties of the solvents. But dehydrating agents, such as phosphorus chlorides, thionyl chloride, and acetic anhydride, have also been on the list as they are tremendously useful for turning unreactive molecules like carboxylic acids to reactive molecules like echochlorides, which can then be used to connect two molecules together into a new one. They can also remove water generated from an equilibrium reaction, for example a condensation, to force the forward reaction to completion. In my previous videos, I have showcased how to obtain common organic solvents from OTC sources, and in future videos I will show how to properly purify and store them. So the solvent issue has been solved. But I'm always troubled by the dehydrating agents. Most of them are dangerously reactive and corrosive, and therefore are not commonly available for sale, and they are quite annoying to synthesize. The amateur chemistry community has put a lot of work in obtaining these reagents through common textbook routes like burning phosphorus and chlorine to make phosphorus pentachloride, and uncommon routes like the sulfur chloride route to acetic anhydride. But the purity of the products obtained from these reactions is far from the grade required to do proper organic reactions, and the precursors of these routes are difficult to obtain and or annoying to make. In comparison, the ketene route to acetic anhydride, which consists of pyrolyzing acetone to produce ketene and absorbing the gas in acetic acid, seems to be the most amateur friendly, since acetone can be readily obtained in most places of the world, except in China, but I still managed to find some. Although ketene is toxic, the experiment could be done outside, and the remaining ketene could be easily detoxified by washing the apparatus with water. And finally, Unlike the sulfur chloride process, the reaction doesn't produce byproducts that would significantly contaminate the acetic anhydride, and it is relatively clean. So I thought that this is definitely a process I should try out. The only disadvantage of the ketene lamp method is that it requires quite a complicated apparatus, including a heating filament, at least one condenser, and a trap. I used a very skillful moving shot to display most of the stuff that I used, including copper and nichrome wires, acetone and acetic acid, some glassware, and the reflux water reservoir filled with ice packs. The plan is to put a piece of filament between the two side joints of the flask, and the ketene produced from the pyrolysis of acetone would flow up the condenser and to the conical flask through a tube. Now to actually put the apparatus together. The filament needs to be connected to a power supply through airtight seals, so I stripped most of the insulation off two thick copper wires, adjusted their length, and bent one of their ends so that the filament could hook on it. Next, I passed the copper wire through the silicone seal ring of the thermometer adapter and allowed the ring to fit on the insulation. The piece was then placed inside the glass part of the thermometer adapter, and the cap was screwed on to create an airtight seal. I do the same with the other copper wire and thermometer adapter. The other ring was slightly damaged and got bigger, so I wrapped some teflon tape around the insulation part to ensure a good seal. Now for the more annoying part, the filament. For my first attempt, I loosely winded some 0.5mm thick nichrome wire onto a pencil and tangled it between the two copper wires by first fixing one end, passing the wire through the flask, and hooking the other end with the second copper wire. I turned on the 12 volt power supply, and despite the current rising to 5.4 amps, the filament was only slightly glowing red. The pyrolysis of acetone requires temperature at 600 to 800 degrees C, so we need to get the filament red hot. The temperature of the filament depends on the current passing through it, and since I cannot apply more current using this power supply, the filament would never be red hot. So I need to switch to thinner wire, and here I am testing with a piece of 0.3mm nichrome. At 4 amps of current, the nichrome glowed perfectly. Note that the acetone vapors will take away heat during the actual reaction, and thus lower the temperature of the nichrome. So in the reaction, we need to use a higher current than 4 amps to keep the temperature high enough. Make sure that your power supply can deliver this current. Now we soap the filament bit, time to get to the actual reaction. Here I have a bottle of what is supposed to be acetone. I didn't distill it or determine its purity otherwise, which might be the central cause to my failure, but at least I found out that it is freely soluble in water and evaporates quickly, and not many organic solvents other than acetone are like that. 
I added 125 grams of acetone to the flask until the filament was only a little higher than the liquid level. This is a huge mistake, as acetone expands when it heats up and boils, and the filament directly touches the liquid acetone and vaporizes it, wasting energy and causing the condenser to overflow. But I didn't realize this at the time, and I simply throw in some boiling chips. The other chemical we need is acetic acid. This acetic acid was supposed to be 99% pure, but it is sort of old and the bottle is leaky. More importantly, the acetic acid didn't freeze when I pour it, but the proper 99% glacial acetic acid I bought later froze instantly at this temperature, which tells me that there's a bunch of water in it, which definitely contributed to my failure later. But I also didn't realize this at the time, and I weighed out 78 grams of it in the conical flask. This is what the final apparatus looks like. A hot plate beneath the flask, the condenser attached, and a silicone tubing leading to the flask containing the acetic acid. I turn on the hot plate and gently boil the acetone. As the acetone heats up, the outlet on the left was releasing gas bubbles, indicating that the apparatus is airtight. The acetone soon started to boil and its vapor front slowly climbed up the condenser. I must stress that the vapor front need to reach the condenser before the filament can be safely heated to red hot, or else an explosion may occur from the remaining air in the flask. When the acetone has refluxed for around 5 minutes, I proceeded to turn on the filament. The vapor front immediately rose up the condenser, but the filament wasn't reaching red hot. The current running through it is 3.9 amps, and only a dim red glow can be seen from the filament. There was some gas output, as well as fumes in the condenser, indicating that there might be a reaction happening, but even if this setup produced ketene, the amount is too small to be collected efficiently. I could no longer increase the current output of the 12 volt power supply, so the only other choice was switching to a full 220 volts. I then winded up a much longer coil using roughly 2 meters of 0.3 millimeter nichrome. The target current we want is 4 amps, so the resistance we need is 220 volts divided by 4 amps, which is 55 ohms, which roughly corresponds to the resistance of 4 meters of the wire. So I winded up another 2 meter coil to act as an additional resistance, and connected the two coils in series. And yes, the coils glowed very nicely. We finally had high enough power to efficiently paralyze the acetone. So I filled the conical flask with 72 grams of acetic acid and proceeded to boil the acetone. The acetone boiled nicely and I switched on the filament. Honestly, I'm nervous because the power I use now is several times than before and I was afraid I'm going to burn stuff up. But none of that happened and the filament simply started to glow red and a lot of fumes are seen in the condenser. These fumes certainly look different from the colorless acetone vapor, and up to this point I was 90% sure I had successfully made everything work and produced ketene. I turned off the hot plate as the acetone can touch the filament and boil it on its own without requiring the hot plate. However, I then realized that my condensing system wasn't operating efficiently, and the acetone vapors reached the top of the condenser and traveled into the flask of acetic acid, which was of course very bad. At this point, nearly no acetone is condensing in the condenser, and most of it just went straight into the conical flask, but there are definitely a lot of fumes coming along with it. Some of the white fumes even escaped the flask, and I started to detect some irritating smell on the downwind direction, so I quickly put up my respirator and moved to the upwind side. Judging by the irritating nature of the gas, now I'm 99% sure I made ketene. A few minutes later, I finally fixed the condensing system, and the acetone vapors are now condensed back into the flask. You can clearly see the interface between colorless acetone vapors and white ketene fumes. Now everything is relatively controlled, and although some ketene is escaping from the flask, I'm wearing a respirator and standing on the upwind side, so now I can let the apparatus run on its own. Now it's time to talk about what is chemically happening. When heated to a high temperature in the absence of oxygen, acetone pyrolyzes into ketene and methane, along with some tar that you can see later deposits on the interior of the flask. Ketene, having two cumulative double bonds, is an extremely reactive electrophile. For example, water can add to its carbon-carbon double bond to produce acetic acid, and acetic acid can further add to its double bond as well to produce acetic anhydride. Normal alkenes do not add with weak nucleophiles such as water and acetic acid in normal conditions, but ketene does because of the alkene functional group bonds to a strongly electron withdrawn carbonyl group. But anyways, bottom line, ketene acts as an acetylating agent that could add acetyl groups to molecules like water and acetic acid. After around 20 minutes of operation, some yellow tar has built up in the reaction flask, and the conical flask was heating up quite a bit as the absorption of ketene in acetic acid is exothermic. I placed the flask inside a beaker of water to remedy this. 
Here's a close-up shot of the absorption. A lot of gas is passed straight through the liquid and escapes, which is most of the methane along with a bit of ketene. You can also see that the liquid level has risen considerably, and although this is mainly due to the excessive acetone that ended up in Flosk, there is definitely an effect of ketene absorption. After another 40 minutes or so, the liquid level in the flask decreased a lot, and the acetone can no longer touch the filament and boil, so I turned on the hot plate to boil it. The plastic clip I used to secure the condenser joint also started melting due to the heat, which was quite annoying to clean up later, so be sure to use a stainless steel clip. Because a larger amount of ketene is emitted, and the wind direction changes very fast, I set up a fan to continuously blow on the ketene gas and carry it to my opposite direction. After around 50 minutes, the acetone is nearly depleted and a lot of tar formed in the flask, so I turn off the filament and allow everything to cool. The total mass of the conical flask and its contents is now 316 grams, which means that it has gained 40 grams of weight, but a large portion of this is just acetone and not ketene. So I decided to add some more acetone to the lamp and run it for a bit longer. This time, you can see clearly how the filament touched the acetone liquid level and boiled it, which of course was far from ideal. I let the lamp run for 10 more minutes before turning off the power. The conical flask now weighs 376 grams, and I was very surprised that it gained so much mass in a short time, and definitely proves that a lot of acetone ended up in there. Anyways, I disassembled the apparatus and proceeded to distill the liquid in the conical flask. Acetone boils at 56 degrees C, acetic acid at 118 C, and acetic and hydride at 138 C. So a simple distillation setup is probably more than enough to separate them. I also connected a new temperature control module that I bought, but it didn't seem to work well, and its temperature measurements are very inaccurate, so ignore the temperature display on it. Initially, lots of acetone boiled over at around 55C, which was expected, but I was worried when liquid still continued to distill at a temperature well past the boiling point of acetone. Nearly all the liquids distilled below 110C, and all that's left in the flask is a bunch of tar, which tells me that the reaction definitely didn't work, and no acetic anhydride was produced. I have no idea what this liquid is. It was heavier than water and soluble in it, but it probably wasn't acetic acid, since their boiling points don't match up. So that's it. I solved the initial issues and saw that the reaction probably worked, but it just didn't produce any product. I don't know why it didn't work, and I would love to hear about any suggestions on the apparatus design, reaction conditions, and whatever else so I can retry this reaction as soon as possible. See you soon!